Hi, and welcome to part two of this PT GUI tutorial series. In part one, we showed you how to take images for a panorama. Now we'll show you how to use PT GUI to stitch those images together. When you open PT GUI, this is what you'll see. Just one tab called the Project Assistant and one button to click. Once you load your images, the rest of the tabs will show up. So let's do that. You start by clicking Load Images and then select the images and click Open. Alternatively, you can drag and drop your images right onto the PT GUI window. Now the images are loaded and this area is your main workspace. At the top are separate tabs for specific functions and clicking this Advanced button reveals a few more tabs but we'll be working with this simple interface for this tutorial. There are also a few helpful tools that you can access from the toolbar or the tool menu. There's the panorama editor, the control point assistant, and the detail viewer. And later I'll go over each of these in detail. For now, let's get back to the project assistant. The images right now are out of order and the two rows of images are lined up side by side. But you don't have to worry about this. Below the images are the camera and lens settings, which you can see have been automatically set. This information comes from the EXIF data embedded in the JPEG files by the camera. The next step is to align the images. Once it finishes, the panorama editor will pop up, presenting you with, hopefully, a perfectly aligned panorama. So what PT GUI did was it analyzed the images looking for matching details with the different photos. When it finds these match details, it marks the images with what are called control points. And you can see these in the control points tab. From these control points, PT GUI was able to figure out how the images overlap, and in this case, figured out that it's a two-row panorama. Although PT GUI may not always be able to find control points for an image. This can happen, for instance, when there are too few recognizable details or too many moving subjects within the image. If this does happen, you'll just have to add the control points manually. You'll know when you need to do this because both the project and control point assistance will show a warning. You can add the control points for these images in the control points tab. Here's our image that lacks control points on the left side, and on the right side is one of the images that it overlaps. What you need to do is find a few points within both of these images that are the same, so you're making pairs. For instance, the corner of this window is in both images, so I'll click here, and then I'll click on the corresponding point in the other image. Once I do that, You'll notice that the new control point is represented by a numbered marker. It's generally a good rule of thumb to create at least four pairs of control points that cover the overlap area really well. Once the third point is added, PT GUI will automatically complete the new control points by using the information from the existing control points. And in most cases, it's quite exact. If the placement is wrong, you can simply click on the point and drag it. If you need to delete a control point, just right click and choose delete. On a Mac with a one button mouse, you can use control click instead of right clicking. To zoom in and out, use control and the mouse wheel or command and the mouse wheel on a Mac. Scrolling is done by dragging with the right mouse button pressed or control drag on a Mac. You can use these red arrow buttons to move through the image pairs. For more tricks in the control points tab, you can click this purple help button here. Now I should have enough control points, but I'll make sure by bringing up the control point assistant. And great, it tells me I have enough. Back in the Project Assistant tab, I'm told that I need to optimize. The optimizer moves the images in such a way so that the control points match as closely as possible. 
Every time you make a change with control points, you should run the optimizer to update the alignment of the images. So I'll run the optimizer now. And then I get a message that tells me the results are very good. So I'll accept them by clicking OK. Now I'll check my control points with the control point table where I can see information on all the points. Every row represents a control point. If I double click a row, I'm brought to that point. The distance column gives an indication of the quality of alignment. The smaller the distance, the better. This control point has a rather large distance, so I want to try to correct it. So now that it's fixed, I'll optimize again. And the results are good. So now is a good time to save the project. This doesn't save the panorama, but rather it saves the project in its current state so you can go back to it later without going through all the previous steps again. Now let's check out the panorama in the panorama editor. Here you can move the panorama just by dragging it, and you can also rotate it with the right mouse button or by control drag on a Mac. This makes it useful for straightening horizons. This project in particular was shot with the camera pointing slightly upwards and the tripod wasn't level, so I'll correct this. First, I'll drag the panorama upwards until all the vertical lines are parallel. And then I'll rotate the panorama to level it. Also, you can change the projection of the image. For an architectural scene like this one, you can, for example, choose the rectilinear projection, which is also called planar or flat projection, since it's the only projection that preserves straight lines. Unfortunately, it has a limited field of view, so you'll see stretching in the corners, which gets worse the wider the panorama. If the image is more than 120 degrees, you'll need to choose a different projection. The cylindrical projection is suitable for 360 degree panoramas. The straight lines curve above and below the horizon, but this is the only way to display a 360 degree image onto a flat surface. An equal rectangular projection is mostly used for fully spherical panoramas. This projection makes it possible to capture the full sphere around the camera in a single image. But I'll switch back to the rectilinear projection since it looks best for this particular image. You can also control the field of view using these sliders. Moving the horizontal slider to the left will reduce the horizontal field of view, which will crop the left and right sides of the panorama. The vertical slider works the same way, but adjusts the vertical field of view. I'll use this to cut off the empty part at the bottom. But as you might have noticed, this ends up cutting off the top of the building. This is because the sliders crop the image symmetrically, which always keeps the horizon centered. If you'd like to crop the panorama asymmetrically, you can drag the yellow crop lines from the edges. There are a few other tools here that assist in editing the panorama. The buttons up here let you see blending modes. Right now we see the blended panorama. If I click on this button, the Show Seams button, it'll show me an unblended version of the image and the red lines indicate the seams of the images, which is useful for identifying possible problems at the seams. Clicking on this magnifying glass here opens the Detail Viewer, which lets you inspect magnified parts of the panorama. This is useful for finding stitching errors. And here we actually have a blending fault because the cyclists were moving while the photos were being taken. And you can see that the cyclists are in one image, but not in the overlapping image, and the seam runs right through the middle of them. This can be fixed using the masking feature in the Pro version of PT GUI. Masking lets you hide certain areas of an image by using content from the other overlapping images. So I can fix the blending fault by just removing this biker here. Actually, the problem isn't completely solved yet 
because the fault is right at the seam between four images. But we can fix this by removing another biker. And now it's fixed. To see even more of what you can do with the mask editor in PT GUI Pro, go to our website and check out the masking tutorial in the tutorials section. And now to create the panorama. Back in the project assistant, I'll click the Create Panorama button, which takes me directly to the Create Panorama tab. Here you have a few settings you can customize. For starters, you can choose the size of the panorama. You can also choose Set Optimum Size and then Maximum, which selects the best size where there won't be any loss of detail. You can also choose from one of these file formats and further adjust the output file by clicking Settings. If you'll be editing your panorama further in an image editor like Photoshop, you can output each image as a layer. Finally, PTGUI by default will save your image using the image or project name and will place it in the same folder as the original image. But of course you can choose to change the name and the location by clicking Browse. I'll save the project once more and then click Create Panorama. And here it is. There was a lot that wasn't covered in this tutorial, but you can always access the help pages in every screen. And if you can't find what you're looking for in the help pages, then check out the support page of ptgui.com. Thanks for watching and have fun, and of course, happy stitching.